Hey there, my new ebook is out. It's called Narcissistic Families, Understand and Overcome. You can download it by using the link in the description. Hello there, my name is Tariana Rocha. I'm a psychoanalyst. And specifically, if you want to recover from childhood narcissistic abuse, if you had narcissistic parents and you want to get over it and live your true self, then this might be the channel for you. In today's video, I'm going to talk about something that's very important to a great portion of my followers and clients, and it's about schizoid adaptations. So that's a fancy word, but what I'm trying to say is I actually got a message that I'm going to read it in a little bit, and this message asked me to talk about how I learned how to have human relationships because I used to completely self-isolate. Now, you might be like, so what's the problem with self-isolation? I sure as hell enjoy it. So do I. That's not the problem. We're actually talking about psychological defenses that will inhibit a person not only from accessing parts of themselves, like certain emotions and desires and needs that they're not even aware of, but these adaptations will also prevent them from actually being able to connect to outside reality. They're not exactly psychotic, though some of them can be, if they are subjected to long periods of stress. People with schizoid adaptations might actually have temporary psychosis, but they do live a life that is very withdrawn into their mental space. So let me get on with it. In this video, I'm gonna tell you a bit of a, um, sorry, my cat, a personal story, because that's what Christian asks me to talk about. Hi, Tariana. I just watched your YouTube video about self-isolation and I could relate from A to Z with how you described it. I, it opened my eyes about how I invest all my time and energy into my art and close to nothing into relationships to others. It feels so safe to be self-reliant and apparently not need people. And it's hard to take steps in the opposite direction. If I might ask, how long did it take for you to find the right balance and were you able to do it on your own? This is an excellent, excellent question and I'm happy to share how I did this. So I actually wrote a few notes here <laughs> to help me remember some important points. And I guess, I guess what I can tell you about my journey, yes, I did kind of do it by myself. I didn't do therapy. I challenged myself from a young age to deal with these defenses and the social isolation. And really, I think I noticed something different about me when I was 12. I just felt incapable of being in the world. So lots of things going on in my life at that time, lots of trauma. And my defense was I just spent my whole day daydreaming, you know, very strong, maladaptive daydreaming to the point where I could not stay present in reality. Sometimes I'd be talking to my sisters and I would literally start talking like to another person that wasn't there. I wasn't seeing another person. It's not psychosis. But, you know, in my mind's eye, there was some sort of daydream going on and I would just disconnect so fast to, to daydream land that I wouldn't be able to pay attention. So at this point, I noticed there was something kind of off about me, but it didn't dawn on me that I could do something about it, should do something about it. When I was around 15 years old, I was talking to the refrigerator. I think I've told this story in another video. And not because the refrigerator was talking back, <laughs> but just because, you know, maladaptive daydreaming. I had very strong fantasies where I had friends in my mind and I would act these daydreams out through physical movement. And as I was, as I was doing that, I noticed my stepfather was looking at me and he was kind of like really scared. Let me just close the door over here, guys. Cats and distractions. And I could see that he was very concerned for my mental health. And he just said, I don't know what this is, but you better deal with it and fix it. <laughs> well, I remember I looked up at the sky and I was like, well, I don't know what I have, but I promise to work on fixing this, figuring it out and actually working through whatever it is 
you know. I had no 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 clarity at all on anything. I didn't even realize that it had to do with social anxiety. I just knew there was something wrong with me. So I guess from that point on, and that's the first thing that I want to talk to you about, I I just took it on me. I took it upon myself to basically learn skills that I wasn't even aware of. I didn't even know which skills those I mean I had I would have to learn, right? I took it upon myself to do the work in the long run because I understood it would be some sort of process. And I also decided that I was going to fix it. So what I'm trying to tell you is if you have any desire to have intimacy with people or social interaction, and this seems really impossible for you, if you just commit to doing the long term learning and you know work really because you have to force yourself to learn how to socialize in ways that make sense to you okay we'll get to that this already goes a long way because these are things that are such inherent adaptations of our personalities that we're really going to need to give ourselves a nudge in the opposite direction so as to be able to create a different habit so to to summarize one, I took it upon myself to do the, the work in the long run, right? And, and also, um, I did recognize, and this is something that could be um, a little bit different, uh, a little bit hard for, for many people. Actually, let me not get to that yet. I'm going to keep on talking about different age ranges and how that affected me. And then I'll get back to what I was going to say. So... That was around when I was 15 years old. Oh my God, there's something wrong with me. I got to fix it. What is it? When I turned 16, I started working and I, I knew this was going to be hard, but I also knew it was very important for me to be able to leave my family home. I just wanted to leave and never go back. <laughs> so I, I decided that I was going to create this financial structure for myself so that I would never have to depend on my parents for anything and so that I could therefore feel safe. You can see here my strong tendency towards hyper independence as a safety mechanism. I'm not going to depend on people who are going to let me down, right? So I just started this whole challenge where I, I worked for years and I found a way of making enough money and, and studying in order to be able to become a flight attendant. So at this time, you know, I I was learning social skills because I really needed to work. And there was no way I wasn't going to do that and just be stuck at home. That was completely unacceptable to me. So what I'm trying to tell you here is that there were useful, practical um, gifts, blessings I got for learning social skills and putting myself out there. And these things helped me feel safer in the world, uh, less derealized because I was dissociated and derealized literally all the time, you know, and it helped me control my maladaptive daydreaming. Now, when I was 19 years old, I had this clear perception of how different I was from other people or how I, how I felt. And I kind of got it into my head that I needed to have a romantic relationship. Now, mind you, I had never fantasized about romantic relationships. I certainly never really wanted them. They never made, they were never part of my plans. My plans had, had got to do with like traveling and, and having hobbies, you know. And, but I got it into my mind that I needed a romantic relationship. And, and this stemmed from this deep sense of being inadequate and different from other people and not really knowing what to do. So I wanted to prove to myself that I was normal. And I thought that normal people had romantic relationships. Well, that didn't go so well because, you know, you have to be actually present in relationships. <laughs> so I discovered much later on that if you're going to have a relationship with a person, don't do it for a crappy reason, such as trying to prove to yourself that you are normal when you're really not understanding how intimacy is formed. And that's, that's kind of the point of the relationship, amongst other things. So, but, but you know, you, you can see how I just didn't really feel very human or, or like other people at all. And I just didn't know the rules or how to do things. And I was 
desperately trying to to make sense of of what I was supposed to be doing with my life. Now, at around um, 25, up to that point, I mean, I had left my family home and I was living, you know, in another city, but really I was just really subjected to all sorts of very toxic, short, little social interactions. I can't say anyone was really my friend, but I remember this was a period of my time where I, I got quite shocked at how brutal the world was and how cruel people could be and they could lie to you and steal from you and you know all of these things that now seem kind of obvious but that were a total shock for me back then so I was like repeatedly um in such situations where I was I was like whoa where am I how did I get here again because you know what I mean I don't know what's going on why are all these people sorry guys I'm just checking if it's recording new mic and I I, I didn't understand why it just seemed that people were so cruel and were always doing mean things to me. Now, this was also around the time where I discovered about narcissistic personality disorder. And then I, I found out my mom um, is a pathological narcissist. And that's a whole story that I talk about in other videos. But the key point here, if you're just watching this video, and this is the first video of mine you've watched and you know nothing about my story, from that point on, I understood because I started studying narcissism and the effects of narcissistic abuse on a person's personality that I was tailor-made to attract abusers because I, I, I didn't know how to read people. I didn't um, know how to say no. I couldn't tell what abuse was. And I'm sure part of this was just from coming from an environment where there was neglect and, and like a very unstable home environment where my safety was being off in my mind, you know what I mean? And it started to become clear to me how these childhood defenses of trying to feel safe inside my head so that I could kind of dissociate from what was going on that these, these defenses had like really, you know, taken over and that due to my upbringing and, and, and to these nar these various narcissistic friendships and relationships that, that I had, I, I really understood that I needed to do something about not only my propensity to not be able to tell what abusive people looked like, but also my relationship with my mom. So that was a whole thing. I ended up going no contact with her. And in that brave decision, because it was a brave decision for me, I just basically decided that now that I've understood a bit about my childhood and what's been holding me back, I am going to give myself everything I freaking want. And so I feel at this point, I wasn't really aware of what I wanted. And I started asking myself lots of questions. I was thirsty to get to know what my own desires were, what, what I was willing to work for, what I wanted my life to be like, you know, what I wanted to use my energy for, my, my focus for. And I remember that a couple years later, uh, when I was 27 years old, I decided I would like to have a friend. So, so see, this was actually the first time when I was 27 years old where I desired intimacy. I specifically wanted to love and to be loved by a friend. Before, I was trying to be normal. I needed to work. So, you know, got to learn these damn skills so I can leave my family home and never go back. But what happened when I was 27, a couple years after reading about narcissism and, you know, being no contact with my mom and just kind of getting to know my own energy because I didn't have her in my mind all the time and I wasn't scared all the time and therefore withdrawing within my inner world. What happened was that it, this desire for intimacy just bubbled its way back up and I felt safe enough to recognize that it existed. Because the truth is, my, my schizoid adaptations, my withdrawal into myself so as not to be hurt or, aban or, or not really abandoned, but, but really not to be overwhelmed by anyone, you know, or invaded by anyone or hurt by anyone. 
these these defenses also involved my absolutely denying that I needed people and that I, I needed love and that I actually did want to feel fully vulnerable and relaxed and like that was completely natural in a normal human experience that anyone should have. It's just that when you figure these things are not available, well, you stop expecting them. And so you just decide, I don't need these things. And it was quite terrifying, um, you know, to, to understand that I did need them. But at the same time, I did acknowledge that. And I want to, to, to let you know this, that I, I don't know you, obviously, but, you know, um, schizoid defenses of, uh, will often involve um, a mixture of deep, inner isolation and honestly a very deep desire for spontaneity for connection for you know there could be loneliness involved so there's a difference between what the dsm-5 symptoms look like on the outside and what for example psychoanalysis would say about the internal dynamic world of of the schizoid mind you know because like the dsm will say schizoids don't give a damn about um social interaction and it's not just that that shallow but psychoanalysis you know will go into into a different uh pers perspective of things a psychoanalysis does and it will it will actually demonstrate that, that many schizoids are actually you know doing this dance where they are deeply vulnerable and, and, and deeply lonely and, and would like to know what it's like to have that sort of thing you know human contact and stuff that makes sense and when i'm where i'm not invaded and you know i'm safe and stuff um but you know the defenses have been there for so long, they're just not even emotionally aware of these things. So that's the other thing I wanted to tell you. So this, this friend of mine, her name is Priscilla. She is one of my best friends to this day. And, and really, what happened between me and her, and, and this is another bit of advice that I'll tell you. So I was 27 now. Remember, I noticed I was different when I was 12. I decided I was going to start working on it when I was 15. I started working when I was 16. I, ha I had my first boyfriend when I was 19 to try to be normal. Up until when I was 25, everyone abused me. <laughs> Didn't know what was going on. And at 27, I'm going to have a friend. So I met Priscilla. And Priscilla was, was literally like uh, someone the universe sent to reparent my, that incredibly wounded little child that was hyper-independent and, and was, was totally unaware of, like, how do you do this whole loving thing, you know? So what was very different here were, were two things. Number one, I was very clear with Priscilla for the first time in my life because I understood I needed to describe things to people about how I worked and I couldn't just say yes to everything. You know what I mean? I was very clear to her about how very hard it was for me to socialize. I told her, I never want to talk to you or anyone else. I just want to study the whole day. And it's incredibly irritating when you call me because I want to focus on like whatever I'm focusing on. But at the same time, I, I know that I need relationships and I do desire them. It's just I don't know how to do them. Could you please insist? And she'd be like, yeah, I don't get it, but sure, I'll insist. <laughs> and she's just like really one of the most loving people I've ever met in my life. And so that part of me that's quite vulnerable um, and because she was loving and incredibly um, patient, you know, she didn't understand anything about schizoid adaptations, but she sure as hell just accepted them and accepted my limits. Well... Eventually, I trusted her enough to like 10 months later, start actually calling her spontaneously or sending her spontaneous messages, I guess. Um, maybe not calling, but sending her a message. You know, that was like something for me because she would always call. I'd rather send me messages. And I was like, ah, what the hell? She wants contact. And then be like, remember, you want a friend? I was like, oh, yeah. And she's loving. OK. And then I would get back to her. But I like it took me 10 months to be the person to initiate conversation because it took me that long to feel safe and not invaded and to be like, well, that's okay. I can have some human contact. Nothing wrong there. <laughs> well, this, this video is getting pretty long. I was going to go into a whole nother aspect of, of that process. Um, but I guess I will do that in another video, right? So the other aspect I was going to go into is when we socialize, when we have schizoid adaptations and we socialize too little, when we socialize too much and when we social socializing just the right way for our schizoid adaptations and for our truest desires underneath them all. And, but I'll do that in another video. If you guys want me to let me know in the comments below. So remember to subscribe, to 
I really want to know your feedback. So really do leave me that comment. And what else I want to tell you? Yeah, about the ebook. So narcissistic families understand and overcome. It's finally out. This is an ebook that I had launched to my, that I had released to my Portuguese uh, public, and now I've translated it into English. And it is my wish that it is a good guide for you to really get the gist of what it is to be the child of a narcissist and how to understand the world, the terminology. There's a glossary of narcissistic terms in the back. And most of all, what do you do about this? How do you heal? How do you heal when you have narcissistic parents and how do you manage them? So make sure you download that book. All of this information is in the link in the description below. And that's it, guys. So let me know what you thought of this video. Do you identify with anything I've said here? Do you have questions? Do you disagree with anything? That's quite fine. We can have a respectful conversation about that. I learn with you guys every single day. All right, guys. So see you next time.